Special Rapporteur in May of this year reported that hate speech is prevalent and underscored that senior government officials traffic in it. Both Facebook and Twitter have been compelled to suspend the account of the Commander-in-Chief of Myanmar's Armed Forces. Why? For engaging in hate speech. An academic study published earlier this year examined Myanmar's state media. It concluded that the state-owned press mirrors the extreme speech of nationalists and signals the state's approval. Mr. President, it is not only the Myanmar state that engages in hate speech. The government's actions have fostered an environment that is rife with extreme racist rhetoric. In August, the UN Special Rapporteur warned again that hate speech remains prolific. As the fact-finding mission concluded, the fact that Myanmar harbors genocidal intent is evidenced by its toleration for public rhetoric of hatred and contempt for the Rohingya. Investigative reporting by Reuters last year identified more than 1,000 examples of extreme hate speech posted on Facebook alone. Many refer to the Rohingya as Kalars. Others call them dogs, maggots, and rapists, suggest they be fed to pigs, and urge they be shot or exterminated. Here are some examples. Kill all the Kalars that you see in Myanmar. None of them should be left alive. If it's a Kalar, get rid of the whole race. Kalar dogs, the Bengalis, are killing and destroying our land, our water, and our ethnic people. We need to destroy their race. We must fight them the way Hitler did the Jews. Pour fuel and set fire so they can meet Allah faster. Mr. President, the fact-finding mission also concluded that Myanmar's genocidal intent is evident in its lack of remorse or even acknowledgement of any wrongdoing. Instead, the Tatmadaw's actions are glorified. The review of state media showed that Myanmar presents the situation as the Tatmadaw gallantly defending the nation's sovereignty against Muslim terrorists. Myanmar denies responsibility for its crimes against the Rohingya, even when confronted with evidence of genocidal acts at specific locations. I will give three examples. One from each of the townships in Rakhine State with significant populations of Rohingya. In each instance, Myanmar has refused to acknowledge any wrongdoing. I will begin at Mingyi in Mongdo Township. You can see its location on the map on your screens. This is a village where every witness interviewed by the fact-finding mission identified Tatmada soldiers as the main perpetrators, and where a survivor reported the Tatmada saying, we have the order to kill everyone, which is precisely what they tried to do. The fact-finding mission estimates that at least 750 people were killed at Mingyi alone. Many were shot, including those who tried to escape by swimming across a river. 
One survivor described how the military killed those who were hiding. Whoever moved was shot. If they looked up or moved their heads, they were shot. The Tatmada rounded up hundreds of Rohingya who could not escape. They separated women and children from the men and systematically killed the men. A witness recounted, the first round of shooting was like a rain of bullets. The second round was slow as the soldiers killed the men individually. They aimed a gun at each man and shot. The soldiers killed those who had survived gunshot wounds with long knives. The Tatmada next turned to the women and children. Some children were shot. Other children were thrown onto a fire. A witness described how the soldiers took infants from their mothers threw them and threw them into the river. Another recounted the slashing of breastfeeding aged children. Another described seeing soldiers stabbing a 10-year-old boy while he was trying to run away. One survivor told the mission that seven of her children were killed. Rape was also widespread. At Mingyi, the Tatmada took women and girls in groups of between five and seven into houses where they, where they were beaten, brutally raped, and frequently stabbed. The young children and infants with them were killed or severely injured, often by stabbing. The houses were then locked and then set on fire. One survivor who escaped from such a burning house recounted, I entered the house with four of my neighbors and three of us had babies. I knew the house. There were dead bodies on the floor, young boys and older men from our village. As we entered the house, the soldiers locked the door. One soldier raped me. They stabbed me in the back of my neck and in my abdomen. She continues, I was trying to save my baby, who was only 28 days old. But they threw him on the ground, and he died. The other women who were there were also raped. Satellite imagery analyzed by UNICEF reveals that Mingyi and its associated hamlets, numbering some 440 structures, were completely burned and destroyed. By contrast, a village to the south, inhabited by ethnic Rakhine, a predominantly Buddhist ethnic group, remains intact. What does Myanmar say about Mingyi? The answer was given by the spokesperson for Myanmar's agent in this case. He blamed the Rohingya. He said it was the ethnic Rakhine and security forces who had been attacked by what he referred to as hundreds of terrorists. Myanmar likewise denies wrongdoing at any of its other thoroughly documented clearance operations, including the one at Mong Nu in Busidong Township, the location of which you can see on your screens. The operation was carried out by a large group of Tatmada soldiers who entered the village in military trucks. A witness recounted that many people were taken to the edge of the hillside and shot. The soldiers approached a compound where a large number of Rohingya had sought shelter and ordered the people 
to come out of the houses or else the buildings would be set on fire. The soldiers separated women and children from men. At gunpoint, the soldiers ordered the women to remove their headscarves, which they used to blindfold the men and boys and tie their hands behind their backs. The soldiers then opened fire on the men and boys and slit their throats with knives. A witness describes how some of them were shot first and then their throats were slit with a knife. Others just had their throats slit. The Tatmada killed children in the courtyard. One witness recounted, the soldiers killed the male members of my family. They shot them first and then slit their throats. The courtyard was full of blood. They killed my husband, my, hus my father-in-law, and my two nephews of 15 and eight years old. They even killed the child in the same way. The fact-finding mission estimates that up to 100 people, mostly men and boys, were executed. 28 of the victims were under 18 years old. Women and girls were gang raped, killed, and mutilated. A victim described how three members of the military took me. One man held me down and pushed me to the ground. They tore off my clothes. Two men raped me. One witness saw a woman killed by being knifed in the vagina. Unisat satellite imagery shows that Mong Nu and a neighboring Rohingya village were systematically burned over a period of several days. More than 320 structures were destroyed. The spokesperson for Myanmar's agent in these proceedings dismissed the evidence against the Tatmadaw officer in command of the battalion that carried out this clearance operation as nothing more than what he called unreliable accusations. Myanmar has also refused to acknowledge responsibility for the clearance operation at Pyot Chin in Rasidong Township, which is now shown on your screens. The fact-finding mission determined that hundreds of Tatmada soldiers participated. After surrounding the village, they opened fire, shooting at villages, villagers, including those who were fleeing. The perpetrators dragged people from houses and shot them at point-blank range. Others were killed by having their throats slit with large knives. One survivor recounted, if people were not killed by the gunshots, they were slaughtered to make sure they were really dead. An elderly woman described being pulled from her house with her 70-year-old brother. Soldiers use rifle butts to beat my brother on the head, and I saw his brains come out. I saw people being killed with long knives. The soldiers were also spraying bullets, and many people were injured and killed. Our village was full of dead bodies. I saw dozens of people killed. First, they shot the people, and then, if they were still alive and the body was moving, they used a machete to slaughter across the throat. The Tatmada set houses on fire, including those still occupied. Other victims were forced inside houses before they were intentionally set alight. In one house, between six and seven men were forced inside. Those unable to, to escape were burned alive. The fact-finding mission concluded that the Tatmada specifically targeted children, including infants and babies. Some were wrenched from their mother's arms and thrown to the ground. Others were thrown into fires 
and burned alive. Women and girls were subjected to rape, gang rape, sexual mutilation, and sexual humiliation. The Tatmada took some to a makeshift military base where mass gang rape occurred. These victims were subjected to serious physical injuries either before being raped or after being killed, including the mutilation of their breasts. UNISAT's analysis of satellite imagery confirms that the entire village was destroyed. By contrast, the nearby non-Rohingya village remains intact. The fact-finding mission estimates that the Tatmada killed 358 people at Shut Pin. The victims included 127 children, all under the age of six. What does Myanmar say about Chut Pien? Just a routine security operation. The Tatmada were searching for militants. No more than 10 people died. There were no rapes. The Rohingya burned their own homes. Mr. President, the fact-finding mission concluded, based on these and other atrocities. That Myanmar's genocidal intent is evidenced by, inter alia, the Tatmadaw's extreme brutality during its attacks on the Rohingya, the organized nature of the Tatmadaw's destruction, and the enormity and nature of the sexual violence perpetrated against women and girls during the clearance operations. The fact-finding mission concluded that further evidence of Myanmar's genocidal intent consists of its lack of accountability or even public condemnation of crimes like those we just reviewed. This conclusion, Mr. President, is consistent with the UN Special Rapporteur's report last month that Myanmar's government allows the military to operate with impunity even though it is responsible for, in the Special Rapporteur's words, the extreme violence that was inflicted during clearance operations, which were executed on an unprecedented scale and with an unprecedented brutality, all indicators of genocidal intent. Mr. President, members of the court, this concludes my presentation. I thank you for your kind attention and invite, ask that you invite to the podium Ms. Pashpanoshja. I thank Mr. Lowenstein and I invite Mrs. Pashpanoshja to take the floor. You have the floor, madam. Mr. President, members of the court, good morning. It is an honor for me to appear before you on behalf of the Republic of the Gambia. You have already heard from my colleagues about the genocidal acts that have been committed against the Rohingya by Myanmar, up to and through the presentation of the United Nations fact-finding mission of report of 16 September 2019. It is my role to address the situation of the approximately 600,000 Rohingya who remain in Myanmar today. Their situation is one of extreme vulnerability, with ongoing acts of genocide against them and the grave risk that even more heinous atrocities, a new clearance operation, or worse, will be inflicted upon them at any time. As the independent fact finders have made clear, the evidence of Myanmar's genocidal intentions has actually strengthened over the past year. In the words of the distinguished Nobel laureate Toni Morrison, who passed away just a few months ago, 
Let us be reminded that before there is a final solution, there must be a first solution, a second one, and even a third. The move toward a final solution is not a jump. It takes one step, then another, then another. I will therefore draw your attention to the steps Myanmar is taking currently that reflect its continuing intention to destroy the Rohingya as a group. Each of these steps has been reported by the highly credible, independent, and eminent investigators acting under the authority of the United Nations, intergovernmental organizations, and human rights organizations. Each of these steps heightens the Rohingya's vulnerability, points towards further acts of genocide, and foretells the risk of more violations of the Genocide Convention. The first step is the forceful segregation and confinement of 20% of the Rohingya in internment camps and ghettos, where they are in situations of extreme precariousness. As the UN fact-finding mission reported, Myanmar forcibly transferred over 120,000 Rohingya men, women, and children into displacement camps outside Sitwe town in central Rakhine state in June 2012. For over seven years now, Myanmar has cordoned them off from the outside world with barbed wire, police checkpoints, and military posts restricted their movements, subjected them to physical and mental abuse, and maintained them in a state of fear for their survival. They remain in that state, easy targets for the next wave of mass killings, especially as they are guarded by the same Tatmadaw that carried out the clearance operations. Myanmar claims its confinement of the Rohingya in their displacement camps is for their own good it claims this is necessary to ensure the protection of the communities from intercommunal violence between the ethnic Rakhine and the Rohingya. But as the UN fact-finding mission report points out, Myanmar has not shown how any actual risks justify this extreme and indefinite restriction of movement. At times, Myanmar has simply denied that there are any restrictions on the interned Rohingya population. Yet, as the UN fact-finding mission observed, the existence of the restrictions on the movement of the displaced population is undeniable. It is attested by the checkpoints and signboards at the entry of the camps, the barbed wires, the experience of those trying to leave the camps, and the simple fact that over 120,000 people have not been able to go back to their place of origin despite their desire to do so. Myanmar has confined a separate group of Rohingya in the Aung Mingala quarter of Sitwe town. The UN fact-finding mission explained that this quarter is effectively a closed ghetto where Muslims are trapped and have lived separately from the rest of the population since 2012. It is guarded by armed police, checkpoints, and barbed wire the Tatmadaw maintains a small presence in the school grounds. People can only leave the quarter with special permission and in organized convoys with police escorts. The remaining 80% of the Rohingya reside in villages under close watch by the Tatmadaw. The UN fact-finding mission's September 2018 report explained that these Rohingya are required to, to obtain travel permits to leave their villages and they're generally not permitted to travel to ethnic Rakhine areas, including the main towns and markets. The September 2019 report indicated that the restrictions have increased in severity over the past year. It noted that the government currently restricts the freedom of movement of Rohingya through a combination of local orders, verbal instructions, security checkpoints, soldiers, and patrols, which have the cumulative effect of confining them to their villages and camps. The UN fact-finding mission has concluded that this state-mandated 
segregation fosters a conducive environment for dehumanization and hate campaigns. Yet, Myanmar is building more internment camps for those Rohingya who have not yet been interned. Refugees arriving in Bangladesh informed the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that the Tatmadaw is forcing men and children as young as 12 years of age to perform unpaid work on 12-hour shifts to build houses and camp-like facilities in different locations in northern Rakhine State. According to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, one interviewee stated, the inhabitants of, inhabitants of his village, which was largely untouched by the violence of 2017, were informed by the village administrator that they would be removed from their homes to a newly constructed camp. Other interviewees described the camps as closed areas with only one entry gate, surrounded by barbed wire and watchtowers. Yet another interviewee expressed fears that the camps had been built with the objective of forcing the Rohingya to live in miserable conditions with the eventual intention of exterminating them. Mr. President, the extermination of the Rohingya, who have been rounded up into internment camps and closely guarded ghettos and villages, can come swiftly at any time in the form of new clearance operations perpetrated by security forces who are stationed there, or it can occur in slow motion through denying them food and other essentials of life. The UN fact-finding mission in its most recent report found that while the former method of destruction could be resumed at any time, the latter method is already in progress. The government has severely restricted access to food for Rohingya in Rakhine State, and the resulting food insecurity is being caused by government laws and policies. Article 2C of the Gen Genocide Convention identifies deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about a group's physical destruction in whole or in part as a genocidal act. Myanmar is implementing its policy of denying food to the Rohingya by various means, including its widespread confiscation of agricultural lands on which the Rohingya grew crops essential to their survival. The UN fact-finding mission determined that Myanmar is undertaking a concerted effort to confiscate these lands. The ongoing confiscations extend beyond the Rohingya villages that Myanmar destroyed during the clearance operations. Rohingya-owned and cultivated land has now been confiscated in areas of northern Rakhine State, where Rohingya remained. Members of the Rohingya group are no longer allowed to consume products from their own lands following the confiscation. The UN fact-finding mission explained that the Tatmadaw is also depriving the Rohingya of food by deliberately killing or confiscating their livestock without permission or payment. One interviewee who fled Buchidang Township explained how this was conducted in his case. Military, police, members of ethnic Rakhine constantly came to the village and looted everything, including food items. The military, military took away my seven cows that I was grassing in the hillside. I cultivated rice in my land. When it was ready for harvesting, members of ethnic, ethnic Rakhine snatched the harvest. I was left with nothing except two goats, which I had to offer to the military for my release. As the UN Special Rapporteur reported based on the evidence it found, there appears to be a policy of forced starvation in place, designed to make life in northern Rakhine unsustainable for the Rohingya who remain there. The Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women made the very same determination earlier this year. <coughs> Mr. President, a further step Myanmar is taking against the Rohingya as a group is the intensified effort to force them to accept national verification cards that explicitly recognize cardholders as non-citizens and brand them 
as Bengalis. While the Rohingya are loath to accept the national verification cards, which erode their right to the identity, without them, they are denied access to essential, life-saving and life-supporting foods and goods and services. The UN fact-finding mission has found that all of these steps, the manner in which the government deprives Rohingya of land, the manner in which the government imposes movement restrictions and deprivation of food, and the manner in which the government denies the Rohingya their identity and deprives them of the rights people need to survive and live with dignity are ongoing and support a conclusion that the government continues to harbor genocidal intent and that the Rohingya remain under serious risk of genocide. As the UN fact-finding mission concluded just two months ago, the Rohingya remain the target of a government attack aimed at erasing their identity and removing them from Myanmar. And this has caused them great suffering. The laws, policies, and practices that formed the basis of the government's persecution against the Rohingya have been maintained. Their plight can only be considered as having deteriorated. Similarly, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar stated just two weeks ago, the system of oppression the Rohingya are subjected to remains unchanged and they are at real risk of recurring genocide. Mr. President, if the Rohingya are to be protected against further acts of genocide, it will be up to the court to order the provisional measures that are necessary for their protection. There is no other alternative. Certainly, Myanmar cannot be counted on to protect them from itself. In the past few years, it has appointed numerous commissions to investigate the genocidal acts that have been reported by the UN fact-finding mission and other international observers. None of Myanmar's commissions have found any violations of internationally protected rights. As the UN Commissioner for Human Rights concluded earlier this year, the establishment of commissions of inquiry has become routine after cyclical episodes of violence in Myanmar. With eight such commissions having been established since 2012, none of the previous commissions has led to the prosecution of any Tatmadaw official. All have been exonerated. Likewise, the UN fact-finding mission concluded in September of this year, Myanmar is not meeting its obligations under the Genocide Convention to conduct an independent criminal investigation into allegations of genocide. The mission draws this conclusion based on the government's pattern of ignoring compelling evidence that genocide took place on its territory and its failure to put in place investigative mechanisms that are independent, prompt, thorough, effective, credible, and transparent. Typical of Myanmar's own investigative mechanisms is its advisory board for the Committee for Recommendations on Rakhine State. It is one of a very few that included international members. Among them, was Ambassador Bill Richardson, a former US representative to the United Nations. He resigned after the first round of meetings, denouncing the board's so-called investigation as a whitewash. Kopsak Chutikul, a Thai diplomat who served as the board's secretary, quit soon thereafter, expressing his concern that the board's existence was going to divert attention from the issues, give a false impression that things are being done. Instead, he said, Myanmar government officials did no more than defend the line that this is an internal matter. We are handling it. We haven't done anything wrong. This is a false narrative. Mr. President, it is Myanmar's narrative that is false. It is also reprehensible. This is what the chairperson of a state-level investigative committee said about the widespread and well-documented rape of Rohingya women. He said it was inconceivable because they are very dirty. The Bengali Rohingya women have a very low standard of living and poor hygiene. They are not attractive. 
so neither the local Buddhist men nor the soldiers are interested in them. In them. The chairperson of Myanmar's investigative committee was not the only one to categorically deny that Tatmadaw soldiers have raped Rohingya women. What you see now before you and at tab 18 of your judges folders is a current screenshot from the Facebook page of Myanmar's agent in these proceedings. As you can see, the Facebook page insisting fake rape, fake rape, belongs to the Myanmar State Councilor Office. Mr. President, members of the court, in the Gambia's view, Myanmar's false narratives like these and its sham investigations further demonstrate the need for you to order provisional measures to compel it to live up to its obligations under the Genocide Convention during the pendency of these proceedings to protect the Rohingya from recurring acts of genocide. Next, my colleagues will show how each of the requirements for provisional measures set out in Article 41 of the Court Statute is fully satisfied, and they will describe the specific provisional measures that are called for in these exigent circumstances. I thank you for your kind attention and ask that you call next to the podium, after the break, if you are so disposed, Mr. Arsalan Suleiman, who will address the court on its prima facie jurisdiction over the Gambia's claims. I thank Mrs. Pasi Panodja. Before I give the floor to the next speaker, the court will observe a coffee break of 10 minutes. The sitting is adjourned.
Please be seated. The sitting is resumed. I will now give the floor to Mr. Arthur and Solomon. You have the floor. Mr. President, members of the court, it is an honor to appear before you and to represent the Gambia in these proceedings. Before the break, you heard the terrible details of the genocidal acts perpetrated by Myanmar's military and security forces against the Rohingya group in Myanmar's Rakhine state. Now, and in the remainder of the Gambia's presentation today, you will hear how these circumstances not only require, but compel the indication of provisional measures under Article 41.1 of the court's statute. The standards that guide the court in ruling on the Gambia's requested provisional measures are well established. First, the court must be satisfied that it has prima facie jurisdiction over the dispute. I will address the elements of that requirement. Second, the rights asserted by the Gambia must be at least plausible, and there must be a link between those rights and the measures requested. Professor Pierre Darjean will, will, will speak to this. Third, there must be a showing of urgency and a risk of irreparable harm, which my colleague Paul Reichler will amply demonstrate. Finally, Professor Philippe Sands will identify the specific provisional measures that are requested and explain why they are required. Now, with the court's permission, I will turn to prima facie jurisdiction. The Gambia has invoked the court's jurisdiction pursuant to Article 36.1 of the Statute of the Court and Article 9 of the Genocide Convention, which provides, disputes between the contracting parties relating to the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the present convention, including those relating to the responsibility of a state for genocide, or for any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3, shall be submitted to the International Court of Justice at the request of any of the parties to the dispute. Both the Gambia and Myanmar are parties to the convention. Myanmar deposited its instrument of ratification on 14 March 1956, and the Gambia deposited its instrument of accession on 29 December 1978. Pursuant to its terms, the convention became applicable between the parties 90 days thereafter. Neither Myanmar nor the Gambia entered any reservation to Article 9 of the convention. Both parties to this dispute have, therefore, consented to the court's jurisdiction over disputes between the contracting parties on the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the Genocide Convention. Because the Gambia has invoked jurisdiction pursuant to Article 9 of the Convention, the court must determine whether the acts complained of are prima facie capable of falling within the provisions of that instrument, and whether, as a consequence, the dispute is one which the court has jurisdiction, ratione materiae, to entertain. As set forth in its application, the Gambia has alleged that Myanmar is responsible for committing genocide, for attempting to commit genocide, for conspiring to commit genocide, for inciting genocide, for complicity in genocide, and for failing to prevent and punish genocide. Clearly, 
the acts complained of fall directly within the provisions of the convention. The allegations are specific and reflect, and in many cases repeat, the conclusions reached by the United Nations fact-finding mission and other authoritative UN bodies, that acts of genocide have occurred and are likely to continue to occur. There can be little doubt that the court has jurisdiction ratione materia. Further, there is an unambiguous dispute between the parties. As the court has frequently held, a dispute between states exists where they hold clearly opposite views concerning the question of the performance or non-performance of certain international obligations and where the claim of one party is positively opposed by the other. The existence of a dispute is a matter for objective determination. If the parties have made explicit reference to the specific treaty in dispute, as the Gambia has in fact done in this case, such an express specification would remove any doubt about one state's understanding of the subject matter in issue and put the other on notice. Mr. President, Myanmar was put on notice of this dispute under the Genocide Convention on several occasions, and it acknowledged receipt of that notice prior to the Gambia's filing of this case. From 5 to 6 May 2018, the member states of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC, including the Gambia, met at a ministerial level in Dhaka, Bangladesh, where, among other actions, they promulgated the Dhaka Declaration. That declaration, expressly, that declaration expressed concern over the systematic, brutal acts perpetrated by security forces against the Rohingya, which constitute a serious and blatant violation of international law, and sought to address the accountability issue for the violations against the Rohingyas in Myanmar through the formation of an ad hoc ministerial committee to be chaired by the Gambia. In response, Myanmar's Ministry of Foreign Affairs issued a press statement three days later to categorically reject the declaration's description of events in Rakhine State as state-backed violence. Myanmar was thus on notice as early as May of 2018 of the newly formed OIC Ad Hoc Committee on Accountability for Crimes Against the Rohingya, chaired by the Gambia and its allegations of state-sponsored violence against the Rohingya. In September of 2018, the United Nations fact-finding mission on Myanmar released its first series of reports in which it found evidence of genocidal acts and genocidal intent attributable to Myanmar in the context of its crimes against the Rohingya. Myanmar dismissed those findings as biased. The Gambia, on the contrary, made clear in its remarks at the United Nations General Assembly later that month that the Gambia has undertaken to champion an accountability mechanism that would ensure that perpetrators of the terrible crimes against the Rohingya Muslims are brought to book. On 2 March 2019, the member states of the OIC held another ministerial level meeting at which they, including the Gambia, adopted a resolution on Myanmar's crimes against the Rohingya, which emphasized that accountability was necessary for preventing genocide and endorsed the recommendation of the ad hoc committee chaired by the Gambia to hold Myanmar accountable under the Genocide Convention. In response, Myanmar again denied responsibility and criticized the resolution as an interference with its sovereignty. On 16 September 2019, 
the United Nations fact-finding mission submitted its second report. Myanmar rejected wholesale the fact-finding mission's report, which welcomed the efforts of states, in particular the Gambia, to encourage and pursue a case against Myanmar before the International Court of Justice under the Genocide Convention. The Gambia, in remarks before the United Nations General Assembly on 26 September 2019, at which Myanmar was present, confirmed that the Gambia is ready to lead the concerted efforts to take the Rohingya issue to the International Court of Justice on behalf of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, and we will call on all stakeholders to support that process. As a global community with a conscience, we cannot continue to ignore the plight of the Rohingya. On 11 October 2019, in furtherance of its support of the conclusions of the UN fact-finding mission, the Gambia's permanent mission to the United Nations sent a note verbal to Myanmar's permanent mission, expressing the Gambia's concerns regarding the ongoing genocide against the Rohingya people in violation of Myanmar's obligations under the Genocide Convention. Noting Myanmar's rejection of the fact-finding mission's report, the Gambia emphatically rejected Myanmar's denial of its responsibility for the ongoing genocide against Myanmar's Rohingya population and its refusal to fulfill its obligations under the Genocide Convention and customary international law. The Gambia concluded, in its, the Gambia concluded its note verbal by declaring, with somber reflection on the goals of the Genocide Convention and its obligations on all states, the Gambia understands Myanmar to be an ongoing breach of those obligations under the Convention and under customary international law. The Gambia insists that Myanmar take all necessary actions to comply with these obligations, including but not limited to its obligations to make reparations to the victims and to provide guarantees and assurances of non-repetition. Myanmar received the Gambia's note verbal on the date it was sent. Myanmar confirmed this by means of its own note verbal to the Gambia's mission to the United Nations, sent from the same email address to which the Gambia had sent its note verbal. Although the court has previously held that a formal diplomatic protest is not required, here there was one. In addition to direct statements and actions in multilateral settings, and additional indicia of Myanmar's awareness of this dispute under the Genocide Convention. Mr. President, members of the court, the Gambia's case against Myanmar, prima facie, falls squarely within the provisions of Article 9 of the Genocide Convention. A dispute over Myanmar's failure to fulfill its obligations under the Convention plainly exists and Myanmar was well aware of this dispute prior to the filing of the application. Mr. President, members of the court, there can be no doubt that the court has prima facie jurisdiction over the Gambia's claims. I thank you and the court for your kind attention and ask that you call Professor Pierre Darjean to the podium. I <clears throat> I thank Mr. Soleman for his statement. J'invite maintenant le professeur Bir Darjan à prendre la parole. Vous avez la parole. Je vous remercie, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, Madame la Vice-Présidente, Mesdames et Messieurs les juges, c'est un grand honneur pour moi de prendre la parole devant la Cour et de le faire aujourd'hui à l'appui de la noble cause soutenue par la Gambie dans le différent qui l'oppose au Myanmar. Il me revient d'examiner la deuxième condition à laquelle est subordonné l'exercice du pouvoir de la Cour d'indiquer des mesures conservatoires. Cette deuxième condition 
est relative aux droits revendiqués qui, selon la Gambie, requièrent de manière urgente protection. La jurisprudence de la Cour sur ce point est bien établie. Et ainsi que vous l'avez encore rappelé le 14 juin dernier, il y a lieu de déterminer si, je cite, « les droits revendiqués dont la protection est sollicitée sont des droits plausibles compte tenu de la base de compétences prima facie de la Cour en l'espèce. Partant, les droits allégués doivent présenter un lien suffisant avec l'objet de l'instance pendante devant la Cour sur le fond de l'affaire. » Fin de citation. Tel est assurément le cas en l'espèce. Après avoir rappelé quelques éléments essentiels relatifs au caractère normatif de la Convention sur le génocide, tel qu'il résulte de votre jurisprudence, j'identifierai plus précisément les différents droits en litige dans la présente procédure judiciaire dont la Gambie sollicite la protection. Leur caractère plausible apparaîtra ainsi clairement. Je montrerai aussi que rien dans l'article 41 du statut, ne s'oppose à l'exercice de votre compétence en matière conservatoire lorsque les droits revendiqués sont de la nature de ceux de la Convention. Monsieur le Président, dans la vie consultative de 1951, la Cour se pencha sur ce qu'elle appela, je cite, « les traits particuliers que présente la Convention sur le génocide ». Et la Cour souligna, je cite, « l'intention des Nations Unies » de condamner et de réprimer le génocide comme un crime de droit des gens impliquant le refus du droit à l'existence de groupes humains entiers. Fin de citation. Ce droit, le droit à l'existence du groupe humain des Rohingyas, est un droit dont le Myanmar doit le respect, à tout le moins à tous les États partis à la Convention sur le génocide, y compris la Gambie. En saisissant la Cour, la Gambie cherche à protéger le droit à l'existence du groupe des Rohingyas, ni plus, ni plus, ni moins. La nature des droits consacrés par la Convention est intimement liée à ses fins. Et se penchant sur celle-ci, la Cour souligna, dans un passage demeuré célèbre, je cite, « Dans une telle Convention, les États contractants n'ont pas d'intérêt propre. Ils ont seulement, tous et chacun, un intérêt commun, celui de préserver les fins supérieures qui sont la raison d'être de la Convention. Il en résulte que l'on ne saurait, pour une Convention de ce type, parler d'avantages ou de désavantages individuels des États, non plus que d'un exact équilibre contractuel à maintenir entre les droits et les charges. Fin de citation. Depuis lors, la Cour a souligné que les traits particuliers de la Convention indiquaient clairement que les droits et obligations qu'elle consacre sont des droits et obligations erga omnes. Par ailleurs, la Cour a affirmé, je cite, que la norme interdisant le génocide constituait assurément une norme impérative du droit international jus cogens. Il n'est dès lors pas douteux, Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs de la Cour, il n'est pas douteux que la Gambie est en droit d'invoquer la responsabilité de l'État défendeur pour les manquements de ces derniers à la Convention. En effet, au sujet de la Convention contre la torture, vous n'avez pas manqué de souligner que puisque les obligations en cause étaient terga omnes partes, tout État parti à cette Convention pouvait, je cite, « invoquer la responsabilité d'un autre État parti dans le but de faire constater le manquement allégué de celui-ci à ses obligations ». Comme la Cour l'a également mise en lumière, c'est, je cite encore, « l'intérêt commun des États partis à ce que soient respectées les obligations pertinentes énoncées dans la Convention qui justifie que tout État soit en droit d'invoquer la responsabilité de tout autre État parti pour manquement, sachant que, je cite encore la Cour, « sachant que si un intérêt particulier était requis à cet effet, aucun État ne serait dans bien des cas en mesure de présenter une telle demande ». Fin de citation. En 2012, la Cour s'est prononcée en ce sens au sujet des obligations erga omnes partes de la Convention contre la torture. A fortiori, doit-il en être de même, et nous le savons depuis l'arrêt Barcelona Traction, a fortiori doit-il en être de même au sujet des obligations de la Convention sur le génocide que la Cour a caractérisées comme étant des obligations erga omnes. Tout État 
peut donc invoquer la responsabilité d'un autre État pour violation des obligations de la Convention sur le génocide sans avoir à justifier d'un intérêt particulier. En réalité, l'État qui invoque la responsabilité d'un autre État pour violation d'une obligation ergomnèse possède bien un intérêt pour ce faire, d'autant qu'il a lui-même droit à voir la Convention respectée. Toutefois, son intérêt n'a rien de particulier. Cet intérêt, partagé par tous les États, est de voir l'intérêt commun, intérêt commun au sujet duquel tous ont des droits, de voir cet intérêt commun pleinement protégé. Ces rappels étant faits, les droits en litige dans, dont la protection est sollicitée apparaissent clairement. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs les juges, par l'action qu'elle a introduite contre le Myanmar, la Gambie met en œuvre le droit qu'elle détient en droit des traités de voir la Convention dûment exécutée. Il s'agit du droit de la Gambie elle-même en tant qu'État parti à la Convention. En effet, comme la Cour l'a souligné, la Convention consacre des obligations, mais aussi des droits, erga omnes. Et ces droits sont l'exact reflet de ces obligations. Les obligations collectives de la Convention se doublent du droit pour chaque partie contractante d'en demander et d'en obtenir l'exécution. Tandis que le caractère erga omnes des obligations de la Convention fonde l'intérêt juridique de tout État d'invoquer la responsabilité de l'État coupable, le droit de tout État parti à la Convention consiste à pouvoir exiger le respect du droit primaire, c'est-à-dire le devoir de l'État responsable d'exécuter l'obligation violée. Il est donc certain que la Gambie détient des droits qui lui reviennent et dont elle entend obtenir le respect par le biais de cette procédure juridictionnelle. La demande de mesures conservatoires est à cet égard entièrement compatible avec l'article 41 du statut, puisque le droit de la Gambie d'obtenir du Myanmar qu'il exécute pleinement la Convention, ce droit est gravement menacé par le comportement de l'État défendeur. Par ailleurs, en cherchant à protéger son droit d'État parti à la Convention, la Gambie cherche par la même occasion à assurer la protection, pour reprendre la formule utilisée par la Cour en 1951, la Gambie cherche à assurer la protection du droit à l'existence d'un groupe humain entier, à savoir le groupe des Rohingyas. À cet égard, il n'est pas nécessaire de déterminer si la Convention personnifie des groupes ou confère directement des droits à des individus en tant que membres de groupes protégés dont ils pourraient se prévaloir en justice. Il suffit en effet de constater que la Convention a pour objet premier et pour but la sauvegarde de tout groupe national, ethnique, racial ou religieux comme tel. Et puisque la Convention interdit le génocide en tant que destruction physique, totale ou partielle d'un tel groupe, elle entend essentiellement protéger le droit de ses membres à la vie et à l'intégrité physique ou mentale. C'est en ce sens que la Convention sur le génocide est souvent considéré comme le premier traité moderne protecteur des droits de l'homme. En effet, chacun des actes criminels définis par l'article 2 de la Convention porte atteinte aux groupes protégés à travers les membres qui le composent, plutôt qu'à travers son patrimoine, son territoire, sa culture ou sa langue. Ce sont des êtres humains, des femmes, des hommes, des enfants, qui, du fait de leur appartenance à un groupe, sont protégés par la Convention, de même que le groupe lui-même. Par son action, la Gambie entend faire respecter son droit à ce que tous les membres du groupe des Rohingyas ne subissent plus d'actes de génocide prohibés par la Convention. À ce stade, il n'est pas nécessaire d'établir définitivement l'existence de ce droit. Il suffit à la Cour de, de constater qu'un tel droit est plausible c'est-à-dire fondée sur une interprétation possible de la Convention. Et tel est assurément le cas, car en imposant aux parties contractantes les obligations de prévenir et de punir le génocide, la Convention protège les groupes qu'elle vise et leurs membres. En ce sens, les bénéficiaires des droits prévus par la Convention ne sont pas seulement les États partis, mais aussi les groupes et leurs membres. Ce sont leurs droits fondamentaux 
qui sont violés chaque fois que la Convention est violée. Leurs droits sont protégés par la Convention chaque fois que les actes couverts par les termes de la Convention constituent en même temps des actes susceptibles de porter atteinte à ces droits humains essentiels. Thus, et je me permets de citer le rapport du juge Gaïa à l'Institut de droit international, thus, a group threatened with genocide has a right towards all the states that genocide should not be committed and be prevented and punished. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs les Juges, l'article 41 du statut vous permet de protéger les droits que la Gambie possède au titre de la Convention, lesquels incluent celui des Rohingyas de ne pas être exposés à des actes de génocide. En, essaie, en effet, ainsi que votre jurisprudence l'indique clairement, les droits pouvant être protégés par des mesures conservatoires sont les droits revendiqués par l'État qui en sollicite la protection, c'est-à-dire tous les droits en litige devant le juge. Comme la Cour permanente l'avait déjà souligné, il s'agit, je cite, « de sauvegarder les droits objets du différent dont la Cour est saisie en attendant le jugement sur le fond ». Et c'est en ce sens qu'à propos des mesures conservatoires sollicitées par la Bosnie-Herzégovine, la Cour a rappelé que les droits protégés, je cite, « pourraient en définitive constituer la base d'un arrêt sur le fond ». L'article 41 permet donc à la Gambie de solliciter la protection de tous les droits en litige au titre de la Convention. Toute autre conclusion, toute autre conception reviendrait d'ailleurs à limiter de manière absurde la compétence incidente de la Cour en matière conservatoire là où elle est pourtant le plus nécessaire. Enfin, les mesures sollicitées par la Gambie tendent manifestement à protéger ces droits elle présente donc un lien avec les droits dont la protection est sollicitée, ainsi que le professeur Sands le rappellera en fin d'audience. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs les juges, je vous remercie de votre bienveillante attention. Puis-je vous demander, Monsieur le Président, de bien vouloir inviter Maître Paul Reichler au lutrin afin qu'il aborde les deux dernières conditions pour l'indication de mesures conservatoires, le risque de préjudice irréparable aux droits revendiqués et l'urgence. Je remercie le professeur Pierre Dargent et je donne la parole à présent à M. Paul Reichler. Vous avez la parole. Monsieur le Président, membres de la Cour, good afternoon. It is, as always, an honor for me to appear before you. This time, it is both a special privilege and a grave responsibility to represent the Gambia in its effort to prevent further acts of genocide against the Rohingya people in Myanmar. These horrific acts committed by the state of Myanmar have been comprehensively documented by the United Nations fact-finding mission, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar, the UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, and numerous independent human rights organizations and experts. Based on these highly credible reports, it is blindingly obvious that there is an urgent need for provisional measures to prevent irreparable harm to the rights at issue in this dispute. The, right, the requirements of urgency and irreparable harm are more than fully satisfied here. This case for provisional measures is among the most compelling that have ever been heard in this great hall of justice. As the court has emphasized in its prior rulings on provisional measures, quote, the condition of urgency is met 
when the acts susceptible of causing irreparable prejudice can occur at any moment before the court makes a final decision on the case. That is precisely the situation here. It is exactly what the UN fact-finding mission concluded in its report of 16 September 2019, which you will find at tab two, page three of your judge's folder. The mission concludes based on its findings that grave violations against the Rohingya continue and that there is a real and significant danger of the situation deteriorating further. The mission also has reasonable grounds to conclude that the evidence that infers genocidal intent on the part of the state against the Rohingya, identified in its last report, has strengthened that there is a serious risk that genocidal actions may occur or recur, and that Myanmar is failing in its obligation to prevent genocide to investigate genocide and to enact effective legislation criminalizing and punishing genocide. These conclusions, as you have heard, are based on thorough and meticulous investigations carried out over a two-year period and resulting in voluminous reports totaling over 700 pages. Even more recently, on 26 November 2019, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in Myanmar wrote, as you can see at tab 14, the Rohingya still living in Rakhine State continue to be denied their most basic rights and are confined to either closely guarded internment camps or remote villages. The system of oppression remains unchanged and they are at real risk of recurring genocide. Mr. President, the evidence that is now before you is several orders of magnitude greater and even more compelling than the evidence submitted by Bosnia in 1993, which the court found sufficient to determine that, quote, there is a grave risk of acts of genocide being committed. On that basis, the court indicated provisional measures to ensure that the parties quote, do all in their power to prevent the commission of any such acts in the future. Since 1993, the court has repeatedly found the requirements of urgency and irreparable harm to be met in situations where the threats to human life or to other fundamental human rights short of life itself were considered serious. In Democratic Republic of Congo v. Uganda, the court ordered provisional measures based on its finding, quote, that persons, assets, and resources present on the territory of the Congo, particularly in the area of conflict, remain extremely vulnerable, and that there is a serious risk that the rights at issue in the case may suffer irreparable prejudice. In the certain activities case, the court ordered provisional measures prohibiting Nicaragua from sending its personnel into disputed territory, in part because, quote, the situation gives rise to a real and present risk of incidents liable to cause irremediable harm in the form of bodily injury or death. 
in Ukraine v. Russia, the court ordered provisional measures on the ground that, quote, Crimean Tatars and ethnic Ukrainians in Crimea appear to remain vulnerable because, quote, certain rights in question in these proceedings, in particular, political, civil, economic, social, and cultural rights are of such a nature that prejudice to them is capable of causing irreparable harm. Here, the Rohingya are not only deprived of their political, social, and cultural rights, they are threatened with massive loss of life itself. And striking at the heart of these proceedings with loss of their very existence as a group. In Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, the court ordered provisional measures to protect the rights of Qataris living in the UAE. The court found that, quote, individuals forced to leave their own place of residence without the possibility of return could, depending on the circumstances, be subject to serious risk of irreparable prejudice. At the time the court made this finding, according to the US, to the UN fact-finding mission, the Rohingya in Myanmar were suffering an even worse fate. They too were forced to leave their own place of residence without the possibility of return. But in Myanmar, the UN fact-finding mission found that this was because the army, the Tat Madaw, deliberately burned thousands of their homes to the ground, often with family members forced to remain inside, and went on to slaughter masses of men, women, and especially children with the intention of destroying the Rohingya as a group. Since then, the threat of genocide has not abated, but grown even worse. As the UN fact-finding mission concluded in its report of 16 September 2019, evidence of Myanmar's genocidal intent toward the Rohingya has actually, quote, strengthened in the past year. In the case of Qataris living in the UAE, the court was of the view that, quote, a prejudice can be considered as irreparable when individuals are subject to temporary or potentially ongoing separation from their families and suffer from psychological distress. When students are prevented from taking their exams due to enforced absence, or when the persons concerned are impeded from being able to physically appear in any proceedings or to challenge any measure they find discriminatory. Mr. President, the Gambia agrees that these are very important human and civil rights whose interim protection by the court is justified where the facts show that their enjoyment is threatened irreparably. If that is so, then how much greater is the justification for provisional measures here? This case is about the commission of genocide, the most heinous of all crimes. The evidence before you makes clear that provisional measures are urgently needed to protect a group that is at serious risk of suffering further genocidal acts which independent observers have warned are capable of recurring at any time, including another clearance operation, which is Myanmar's own Orwellian term for the targeted killing of Rohingyas, burning of their homes and villages, and especially brutal and depraved acts of, sensu of sexual violence against women and girls. The very kinds of atrocities the Genocide Convention was intended to prevent. Mr. President, if provisional measures were justified in all of these cases, they must be justified in this one.
More recently, in the alleged violations of the Treaty of Amity case, the court, using language that is especially pertinent here, found that, quote, a prejudice can be considered as irreparable when the persons concerned are exposed to danger to health and life. The court ordered provisional measures, notwithstanding the assurances given by the United States that it would use its best endeavors to ensure that humanitarian or safety of flight related concerns receive full and expedited consideration. The court explained, Quote, while appreciating these assurances, the court considers nonetheless that insofar as they are limited to an expression of best endeavors and to cooperation between departments and other decision-making agencies, the said assurances are not adequate to address fully the humanitarian and safety concerns raised by the applicant. Therefore, the court is of the view that there remains a risk that the measures adopted by the United States may entail irreparable consequences. Without question, if humanitarian and safety concerns merited provisional measures to protect the people of Iran against an economic and commercial embargo, they are absolutely indispensable here, where the Rohingya face every single day the risk that they and their children will be killed or raped en masse pursuant to what independent expert investigators have found to be Myanmar's ongoing and strengthened genocidal intent. In the case between Iran and the United States, the court found that the assurances of the respondent state could not serve as a substitute for provisional measures. Even less can they substitute for provisional measures in this case. Myanmar, from its highest official levels, has been giving empty assurances to the United Nations repeatedly since even before the first clearance operation in 2016, and it continues to do so. It backs them up with phony investigations finding no wrongdoing whatsoever. A complete whitewash, in the words of a former United States ambassador. A total lack of accountability, according to the UN fact-finding mission. The UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in Myanmar recently explained why Myanmar's assurances cannot be relied upon in a document you will find at tab 14. Those responsible for these violations enjoy impunity, which perpetuates the devastating cycle of abuse. This is because the emboldened military leadership retains a firm grip on politics and the economy while the government has so far proved unwilling or unable to make any significant move against it. Under present conditions, the special rapporteur concluded, Myanmar is simply, quote, incapable of delivering account accountability. Incapable of delivering accountability. The special rapporteur ended with a warning that the military, backed by Aung San Suu Kyi, has responded with defiance and with the immediate threat of further atrocities present, more must urgently be done to prevent further tragedy. Mr. President, as if to prove the special rapporteur's point, soon after the Gambia's application was filed with the court, 
Billboards were posted across Myanmar like this one, which you will find at tab 20. The three smiling Tatmadaw generals behind the agent are Myanmar's Minister of Border Affairs, Minister of Defense, and Minister of Home Affairs. This shows, in fact, it can only have been intended to show that they are all in it together and that Myanmar has absolutely no intention of holding its emboldened military leadership accountable. Mr. President, in these circumstances, for the court not to order provisional measures would be to completely ignore the imminent risk of death and destruction that the Rohingya face today and every day during the pendency of these proceedings. And it would be a complete break with the long and distinguished line of jurisprudence that the court itself has firmly established and very recently confirmed. There is law and there is also morality. They are not opposed. In its advisory opinion on reservations to the Genocide Convention, the court explained, the convention was manifestly adopted for a purely humanitarian and civilizing purpose. It is indeed difficult to imagine a convention that might have this dual character to a greater degree, since its object, on the one hand, is to safeguard the very existence of certain human groups, and on the other, to confirm and endorse the most elementary principles of morality. What happens when international institutions lack the will to uphold these elementary moral and legal principles. Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire, commander of the UN peacekeepers in Rwanda in 1994, offered sobering testimony, which you will find in your judges' folders at tab 21. Almost 50 years to the day that my father and father-in-law helped to liberate Europe, when the extermination camps were uncovered, and when in one voice, humanity said, never again, we once again sat back and permitted this unspeakable horror to occur. We could not find the political will, nor the resources to stop it. There is no uncertainty about who we are. According to the report of the independent inquiry into the actions of the United Nations during the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, quote, the United Nations failed the people of Rwanda during the genocide in 1994. It is a failure for which the United Nations as an organization, but also its member states, should have apologized more clearly, more frankly, and much earlier. Mr. President, members of the court, apologies are not enough. They always come too late when there is already something to apologize for. The failure to act and the resulting catastrophe that might have been prevented. And as history has shown, when the international community fails to act, it only invites further catastrophes. In Lieutenant General Dallaire's distressingly prophetic words, quote, the genocide in Rwanda was a failure of humanity that could easily happen again. Mr. President, tragically, it has happened again in Myanmar. And still, the world has not yet found the will or the means to stop it. So say the independent fact-finding reports of highly credible investigators acting under the mandate of the United Nations. 
So say the most respected international experts on genocide, including those of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, who have written, shocking in scale, the mass atrocities against the Rohingya were predictable and preventable. Following decades of escalating persecution, including the revocation of citizenship and restrictions on basic freedoms, the Burmese government, as well as the international community, failed to respond to the early warning signs and prevent the genocide. Mr. President, genocide in Myanmar is happening still. Of course, Myanmar denies this, as have all the perpetrators of genocide throughout history. But the UN fact-finding mission, the UN Special Rapporteur, and other independent experts and observers have heard all of Myanmar's excuses and explanations and found them unconvincing and even cynical and refuted them one by one in their detailed reports. The Gambia has come to the International Court of Justice in the face of an insufficient response by the international community because as its agent so eloquently put it, it has faith in this court to uphold the Genocide Convention and the humanitarian and civilizing purposes it reflects. The time to prevent further genocide is now because nothing less will save the Rohingya from their ultimate destruction as a group. In these proceedings, the Gambia asks you to order Myanmar to do what it is already obligated to do under the Genocide Convention, but has refused to do and cannot be counted upon to do without the court's intervention. The court spelled out these obligations in its judgment in the Bosnia genocide case, where it made clear that the obligation to prevent genocide does not only come into being when perpetration of genocide commences. That, the court said, would be absurd, since the whole point of the obligation is to prevent or attempt to prevent the occurrence of the act. In fact, the state's obligation to prevent and the corresponding duty to act arise at the instant that the state learns of or should normally have learned of the existence of a serious risk that genocide will be committed. From that moment onwards, if the state has available to it a deterrent effect on those suspected of preparing genocide or reasonably suspected of harboring specific intent, it is under a duty to make use of these means. Mr. President, the Gambia asks you to order provisional measures that require Myanmar to fulfill this obligation by refraining from any further acts of genocide and by using every means at its disposal to prevent further acts of genocide against the Rohingya people. In two words, Mr. President, the Gambia asks you to say to Myanmar, never again, and to say it in the clearest of terms and with all the legal and moral force that this highest of all international judicial authorities commands. The UN fact-finding mission, at the conclusion of its report of 16 September 2019, made a series of recommendations to the United Nations and the international community on actions that must be taken to prevent further genocidal acts against the Rohingya people. Among them is this one at tab 2, page 22. Encourage 
and support states party to the Genocide Convention to bring a case to the International Court of Justice against Myanmar for breaches of its obligations under the Genocide Convention. The Gambia has heeded that call. On its own behalf, as a state party to the Genocide Convention, on behalf of the 57 member states of the Organization for Islamic Cooperation, which have fully endorsed and encouraged this case, and most especially, on behalf of the Rohingya people, whose hopes for survival as a group in Myanmar now rest with you. On behalf of all, Mr. President, the Gambia calls on this honorable court, humbly and respectfully, to indicate the particular provisional measures that are urgently required in these exigent circumstances and that my distinguished colleague, Professor Sands, will describe for you. Mr. President, members of the court, this concludes my presentation. I thank you, as always, for your kind courtesy and patient attention, and I ask that you call Professor Sands to the podium. I thank Mr. Reichler for his statement. I now invite Professor Sandis to take the floor. You have the floor. Mr. President, Madam Vice President, members of the court, it is a privilege, albeit a regrettable one, to appear before you on behalf of the Gambia on this application concerning the crime of genocide. My colleagues have addressed the evidentiary and legal prerequisites for the order on provisional measures that we seek, and my submissions now turn to the specific provisional measures we request and why they are needed. This court is the ultimate guardian of the Genocide Convention and it is on you that the eyes of the world are turned today at this preliminary stage of the proceedings. The court's well-established conditions for the grant of provisional measures are amply met as you have heard. This application is brought to protect hundreds of thousands of people from a multitude of acts that are genocidal. Back in 1948, the drafters of the convention well knew the consequences of a failure to prevent acts of genocide. They created a system to allow steps to be taken to respond to a future genocide. That is why a convention was proposed. That is why it was negotiated and adopted. That is why Article 9 bestows a jurisdiction on this court to ensure that the obligations set forth in the Convention and the rights of the Gambia are respected, including by provisional measures. Mr. President, as you well know, this is not the first time the court has been asked to protect rights under the Convention. In April 1993, in the Bosnian genocide case, the court ordered the government of the FRY to take all measures within its power to prevent commission of the crime of genocide. And it did so by a unanimous decision. It also voted by 13 votes to one to adopt a further order addressing in particular the acts of military, paramilitary and irregular armed units. Five months later, it reaffirmed those measures and called for its earlier order to be immediately and effectively implemented. Mr. President, we do not wish to be back here in five months' time. Our hope is that the court will order 
provisional measures that are clear and specific. Our expectation is that Myanmar will comply fully with a binding order of this court. The provisional measures we seek are concerned, all of them, with genocided related activity. As ad hoc judge Lauterpacht put it back in 1993. As Mr. Reichler made clear, it's difficult to imagine many situations the court has faced in which the need for provisional measures has been more acute. The evidence before you, frankly speaking, is overwhelming. The risk of destruction of the Rohingya group, in part or in whole, is very real. In light of that evidence, it cannot reasonably be argued that there is no further risk of genocidal acts. And the further harm that is anticipated to occur cannot be undone or recompensed. As the court put it in the Bosnia case, and I quote, no reparation could efface the results of conduct which the court may rule to have been contrary to international law. In the face of Myanmar's failure to give effect to a multitude of calls repeated to desist from acts that give rise to genocide, we submit that this court must act. And the question before you is not whether to order provisional measures, but what provisional measures to order. The Gambia seeks six provisional measures. The first and the second require Myanmar to act with immediate effect to prevent the further genocide of the Rohingya group. The third measure requires Myanmar not to destroy or render inaccessible any evidence relating to the events already described in the application. This is to ensure the integrity of the proceedings before this court and the proper fulfillment by the court of its dispute settlement function. The fourth and fifth measures require both parties not to take any action and positively to act to prevent any action which might aggravate the dispute or render it more difficult of resolution and to provide a report to the court on implementing measures. And the sixth measure, which we made available yesterday, requires Myanmar to cooperate with the United Nations bodies that seek to investigate the acts that are the subject of this case. Each of these requests is based on the court's jurisprudence. Turn to the first two provisional measures. They are directed, Mr. President, to Myanmar's obligation to prevent genocide. First, by taking all measures within its power to prevent genocidal acts against the Rohingya group. And second, by ensuring in particular that any military, paramilitary, or other organizations under its direction or support or subject to its control or influence do not commit acts of genocide against the Rohingya group. The written application sets out the specific acts which are sought to be prevented. All of them fall within the list of genocidal acts defined in Article 2. And as you have heard, there is compelling evidence that each of these acts has already been perpetrated and is being perpetrated right now against the Rohingya group by Myanmar or by entities acting under Myanmar's control or at its behest. Accordingly, the request for these two provisional measures goes to the very heart of the Gambia's application to uphold and to enforce the Genocide Convention and its rights under it to protect the Rohingya group against total or partial destruction. Mr. President, the measures requested are grounded in the recognition of, I quote, the value in humankind, end of quote. The idea that every human being is expected to have, and I quote, a value 
and dignity of her kind or his kind, end of quote. Those words will be familiar to some in the room. According to the United Nations fact-finding mission, regrettably, that is not the situation in Myanmar today, as far as the Rohingya are concerned. Indeed, in 2016, the State Councillor and Foreign Minister of Myanmar is reported to have insisted to the United Nations that it must refrain from even using the word Rohingya. And I quote, we won't use the term Rohingya because Rohingya are not recognized as among the 135 official ethnic groups, end of quote. The agent's ministry affirmed that statement. The foreign ministry of Myanmar has simply refused to recognize the Rohingya as a group, and it has overtly sought to dehumanize the group and its members. In September 2018, the UN fact-finding mission reported on a communication from the foreign ministry that included links to four videos about the, 19, about the August 2017 events in Rakhine State. The four videos were each imbued with explicitly anti-Muslim and anti-Rohingya messages. The UN fact-finding report does not mince its words. It states, and you'll find it at tab one, as follows. The state councillor, Do Aung San Suu Kyi, has not used her de facto position as head of government, nor her moral authority to stem or prevent the unfolding events or seek alternative avenues to meet the government's responsibility to protect the civilian population, or even to reveal and condemn what was happening. On the contrary, the civilian authorities have spread false and hateful narratives, denied the Tatmadaw's wrongdoing, blocked independent investigations, including of the fact-finding mission, and overseen the bulldozing of burned Rohingya villages and the destruction of crime sites and evidence. End of quote. And the fact-finding mission is not alone in expressing these concerns. Very recently, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in Myanmar has gone even further in her expression. The Gambia's application is premised on the view that the Rohingya group and its members are a part of humankind, and they have a value and a dignity, and that they are entitled to the fullest protections of the Convention from any act which is plausibly capable of being characterized as genocidal before it is too late. Given the evidence before the court as to what has already occurred, and given the length of time these proceedings are likely to take, the need for, protect, for protective measures to assure the survival of the Rohingya as a group in Myanmar and the Gambia's rights as a state party to the convention is pressing and urgent. The primary obligation arising under Article 1 of the Convention and the rights it creates is the duty on state parties to prevent genocide. That duty seeks to give effect to the words of Raphael Lemkin, whose book Axis Rule in Europe, published in the autumn of 1944, first coined the word. You will have it at tab 23, and this is from that first edition. Genocide does not necessarily mean the immediate destruction of a nation, he wrote. It is intended, rather, to signify a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of the essential foundations of the life of national groups. It is not a single act genocide. It does not occur at a single moment. It comprises different actions, the objectives of which include the disintegration of social and political institutions, followed by, as Lemkin put it, the destruction of the personal security, liberty, health, 
dignity and even the lives of the individuals belonging to such groups. The intervention of a court, therefore, does not have to await the final moment, although in the case of the many thousands of lives of individuals belonging to the Rohingya group, that moment has already come and gone. Genocide is a continuum, and you are called upon to act now as acts of genocide have occurred and are continuing to occur. The ILC articles on state responsibility make clear that obligation to prevent a given act extends over the entire period during which the event continues, an approach the court confirmed in its Bosnian genocide judgment in 2007. The order for provisional measures we seek would require Myanmar to respect and comply with its Article 1 obligation. It is the only means to ensure that the rights of the Gambia and of the Rohingya group are further safeguarded under international law. It is the only means to ensure that the ability of this court to resolve the dispute is not compromised by further acts of Myanmar rendering the partial or total destruction of the Rohingya group in Myanmar a fait accompli. The first two provisional measures sought in this application are equivalent to those ordered by this court in the Bosnia genocide case, and they serve the same conservatory purpose. Here, as then, an order on provisional measures does not anticipate or prejudice the final judgment, and it is in conformity with the nature of interim measures because they are the only means to preserve the substance of the rights pendente lite. Furthermore, just as in that and other cases in which the court has considered provisional measures, irreparable damage is at risk here. You will recall to achieve its protective function and having regard to the experience in the Bosnia case and in particular, and I emphasize this, the fact that the killing of 8,000 men in Srebrenica occurred two years after the court ordered provisional measures. The Gambia submits that something more is needed here, that the court's order should and must identify on a non-exhaustive basis particular acts of genocide, which the evidence shows have already been committed and which must not recur. As set out in the reports of the UN fact-finding mission and other bodies, these acts include extrajudicial killings, physical and mental abuse, rape and other forms of sexual abuse, the destruction of homes and villages, forced starvation, denial of access to medical treatment and humanitarian assistance, and restrictions on movement. In our respectful submission, your order must explicitly set out acts of a genocidal nature which are to be avoided and prohibited. Specificity of an order can only help to contribute to their non-recurrence. In the present appalling circumstances, the court's order, should we submit, indicate provisional measures of as great a specificity as possible. Only in this way can we hope that the rights of the Gambia and the safety of the Rohingya group be fully protected. Mr. President, I turn briefly to the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth provisional measures. The Gambia also seeks what might be called procedural provisional measures, with the aim overall of protecting the integrity of the proceedings before this court. The measures requested have several objectives. In particular, they will first contribute to the preservation and accessibility of evidence on the merits of the dispute. Second, prevent any aggravation or extension of the dispute between the Gambia and Myanmar. And third, assure the implementation of the foregoing provisional measures by providing for reporting on them within four months of their issue. To these measures, the Gambia has added a sixth provisional measure. This is necessitated by Myanmar's persistent refusal 
persistent refusal to cooperate at all with the United Nations fact-finding mission or any other independent fact-finding mission, including the UN Special Rapporteur. In particular, Myanmar has refused all such missions access to Rakhine State to the scenes of the Tatmadaw's clearance operations or to the places where genocidal acts against the Rohingya are reported to have been committed. This deliberate effort to prevent access to evidence of genocide, which is documented in the UN fact-finding missions reports, must not be allowed to continue during the pendency of these proceedings because, we say, it constitutes an obstruction of the fair administration of justice, which it is the court's responsibility to ensure. And so, accordingly, as a sixth provisional measure, we request that Myanmar be ordered to grant access to and cooperate with all UN fact-finding bodies that are engaged in investigating alleged genocidal acts against the Rohingya, including the conditions to which the Rohingya are subjected. These provisional measures, the third through the sixth, are necessary to ensure that the court is properly equipped in due course to adjudge the merits of the underlying claim, including the facts, and to ensure that the dispute can be considered fairly and comprehensively by reference to all relevant material. The order is necessary where there is an evidential imbalance between the parties, since the acts complained of occur on the territory of Myanmar, which has the primary control of all the first-hand evidence. In such a case, where access to various areas has been prevented, the court, we submit, has a responsibility to ensure the fair disposal of the claim. Moreover, the indication sought will also assist in protecting against non-compliance or inadequate compliance, as so regrettably happened in the Bosnian genocide case. The court has, in other cases that involve the rights both of states and individuals, required parties to inform it of the progress made in implementing its orders. We are not looking for an excessively active continuing role in these matters, but given the gravity of the situation, given the likely length of future proceedings, and given, in particular, what occurred in Bosnia and Srebrenica after the court's provisional measures in that case, we submit that the facts of this case call for a clear reporting requirement. Mr. President, to sum up, the indication of provisional measures is, we recognize, without prejudice to the merits of the underlying claim. Yet the evidence at this stage indicates grave violence and genocidal acts against the Rohingya group in flagrant contravention of the Genocide Convention and in breach of Gambia's rights. The consequences of not indicating clear and particularized specific provisional measures and not taking steps to intervene in Myanmar's disregard of its international obligations would, we fear, be very grave indeed for the Rohingya group who remain at real risk of further genocidal acts for the future effectiveness of the Convention, for the rights of the Gambia, and for the reputation of this court, which is equipped with and must exercise its powers to afford an effective realization of the rights under the Convention. That means we respectfully submit, indicating the provisional measures sought by the Gambia, as well as any others in addition, the court might deem appropriate. The balance of equities points overwhelmingly in favor of far-reaching provisional measures. Mr. President, Madam Vice President, members of the court, many in the Great Hall today, which happens to be International Human Rights Day, will have read a fine book with the title, If This Is a Man, by the Italian writer Primo Levi. It was published in 1947. You will find the relevant extract at tab 24. In the preface, Primo Levi recorded a concern which might be said to be of universal application. He wrote, and I quote, 
many people, many nations, can find themselves holding more or less wittingly that every stranger is an enemy. When this happens, Primo Levi continued, and I quote, when the unspoken dogma becomes the major premise in a syllogism, then at the end of the chain, there is the lager. In the case of Myanmar and the Rohingya, when it comes to the merits, this court will have the authority to break that chain. In the meantime, what you have is the power of interim relief, and we place our hope in your willingness to fully discharge your judicial responsibility and powers. Mr. President, members of the court, I thank you for your kind attention. This brings the Gambia's first round to a close. I thank Professor Sands. Your statement indeed brings to an end today's sitting. The court will meet again tomorrow, 11 December 2019, at 10 a.m to hear this first round of oral observations of Myanmar. The sitting is adjourned.